Happy Father's Day, Dad. My dad is special because he is the most thoughtful and generous person I know, and he is always taking care of the people around him. My dad always sends articles and videos that he thinks my students will enjoy, and he always keeps my classroom stocked with books. Dad, thank you for teaching me to be kind, independent, and ambitious. Thank you for always being there for me and for being my friend. I love you. What I remember about my dad is he was a friend to everyone. His co-workers loved him. He worked with the youth at our church for 20 years and was a friend and a counselor. And all my friends were very comfortable coming to our house because they knew they would have a good time. I was very blessed. There aren't too many people at Trinity who remember my dad. August will be 40 years since he's passed away. But the one trait of Pops I always admired was his honesty. In 1968, he was giving up farming and we were having an option to sell the cattle and machinery and contents in the barn. When it came time to sell the hay, Pop says, boys, I gotta tell you, this first batch of hay here was damp when we bailed it. I just wanted you to know that. Would you believe that that hay sold at a higher price than the hay that had not gotten damp? That was Pop and his honesty. He set a bar that I've tried to live up to all my life. Tell the truth and be honest. So happy Father's Day, Pop. I love you and I miss you. Dad, we wanted to say happy Father's Day and that we are blessed to have you in our lives. Thank you for instilling in us the morals and values that we carry with us today. Dad, we are so grateful for all the things you do for us and continue to do for us and our families. Happy Father's Day. We, we love, love you. you. I have so many wonderful memories with my dad, going for walks on the railroad track with our possible bag, checking on our plants in the garden every morning before I went to my grandmother's for the day, making Halloween costumes from scratch, being there for the birth of my children. But I think the thing that I love most about my dad is that no matter what choices I've made in my life, he has always treated me with respect and never treated me like anything other than his little girl. And you'll never know how much I appreciate that, Dad. I love you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you for everything that you do for our family and always supporting me. I love you. I like that I played baseball with him every day. Play catch and it gave me batting cages. Play catch with me in the park. Yes, I am. And I think that our dad is special because he never tells me that I can't do things like switching schools or switching majors and he's proud of me no matter where I go or what I do so that support gives me a lot of freedom to kind of go out into the world and try things that I want to do. Happy Father's Day! We love you! Happy Father's Day everybody! Uh, what a great place for me to be standing right here in this barn around the cows because this is where Dad and my dad and I spent all our time together. Uh, dad passed away a little over a year ago, but thank you Dad for everything you've done, not only for me, but my family. Um, and we're going to keep this going for generations to come because the next one's on its way. Happy Father's Day everybody. God bless. My name is Alexandra Bull and one of the things I love about my dad is his sense of humor and he can always find a way to make me laugh even when I'm not in the mood for laughing but um, he also has a secret love for my dog Lucky. Um, Lucky always curls up in his office um, but um, my favorite memory would probably be Peekster Day. Many of you probably don't know what that means but my dad does. Um, I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Dad. What a great way to tell you how much you are loved and admired, although I can't fit it all into this one short video, so I'll leave it at this. Thank you for your wisdom, your humor, 
for being a fun and energetic papa to Aiden and Owen and your special ability to be able to fix anything. You are a gift to us all. I love you. Good morning and welcome to the digital worship service of Trinity Evan Lutheran, Evangelical Lutheran Church in Boonesboro, Maryland. Uh, it's the third Sunday of Pentecost, but also it's Father's Day. Uh, congratulations, fathers. God be with you. We will pray for you today because it's hard to be a father. It's hard to be a mother in these days. Uh, we're glad you're here when we are, well, if we ever get finished with our pandemic and we move back into our building, we certainly hope you come and join us. Uh, and if you have any special needs that we might be able to help with, we invite you to contact us through our website or on our telephone. Thank you. Let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Receive the, the, receive the forgiveness of our Lord. 
Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Your sins are forgiven. Now you can live in hope, for hope doesn't disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. The introduction. Jeremiah accuses God of forcing him into a ministry that brings him only contempt and persecution. Yet Jeremiah is confident that God will be a strong protector against his enemies and commits his life into God's hands. The reading. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have empowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then, there, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding an in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him, and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Here ends the reading of the first lesson. Good morning. The second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 1b through 11. In baptism, we were incorporated into the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. We have been made new in Christ through his death and resurrection to live freed from sin. The lesson. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all, the, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, chapter 10, beginning at verse 24. Jesus warns his disciples that their ministry in his name will meet opposition. However, he assures them that they need not fear for the truth will come to light. Life is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. 
Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, remember this? That was easy. Oh, yeah, only about 15 years ago, Staples came up with this idea. You know, they sold a million of these buttons in the first year that they were available. You can still get one. It's, it's pretty... That was easy. Pretty easy to get it. Uh, and, you know, isn't it funny? They, they not only sold a million of these in the first year, people started going to Staples and buying all sorts of stationery. Um, and since then... Hasn't it gotten easy? You've got a little button like this on your computer now whenever you're with Amazon. It's just that easy. You don't even have to write it out. It's just, you just press the button. It's, man, it got easy. And I can see why it got easy, and you can see why it got easy. Because life is so hard. And uh, sometimes easy things happen in a hard life, and sometimes some hard things can happen when your life is even easy. And I want to talk about the interplay between easy and hard. And you know, when you're talking that, you're right up, the, you're right in the vocabulary of the Bible. The very, one of the very first stories on the very first pages of the Bible, you've got this beautiful garden that God gives to Adam and Eve. And you know, it's so easy. Pick, pick any fruit you want. You can have anything. Um, but there's this one tree. Don't mess with that tree. Don't take any fruit off of that tree. Well, you know, as easy as it was for them, they weren't able to resist. It was just too hard to let that one tree go. And the Bible's filled with stuff like this. The children of Israel, I remember your Sunday school classes. The children of Israel are in bondage in Egypt for hundreds of years. And you know, what the, you know what the bondage is. It's not just that they're in Egypt. They are being oppressed by the Egyptians. They're being exploited by the Egyptians. It's a metaphor for all that is wrong. It's a metaphor for sin. The things that keep us from being what we want to be. And on the one hand, it's easy. They've got God on their side. And through the 10 plagues, God is able to rescue his people. God opens up the sea and away they go. It's easy. But it ain't so easy. It takes them 40 years to travel the 400 miles from Egypt to Israel. And you know all the griping and you know all the hardship and you know all the hunger they went through and the thirst that they went through on the way. And the temptation, you know, as much as they griped, as much as they hated it when they were in Egypt under oppression and they were not free, over and over out in the desert, the cry was, let us go back there. At least we had food. At least we knew what to do. Uh, we didn't have to think about how hard life was. Um, we could gripe all we wanted. Now we have to be responsible for ourselves. And it took 40 years for them to get to the point 
where they could be responsible for themselves, where they could be free in that land of milk and honey. And again, that's another metaphor. It's a, for you and me, it's like a metaphor for heaven. It's that place we're going, that place we need. But we keep wanting to look back. As bad as it was, we keep wanting to look back. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for sin and freedom. And if, it's, if you don't, if you don't it, it is not easy to get rid of our sin. Look what our country's going through right now, trying to rid itself of the sin of racism. 150 years ago, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. It's easy to sign something. It's so hard for hearts to change. And 40 years ago, when I watched Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on TV, it was already, already progress had been made, but so much more had to be done. It is not easy because that sin is in our culture. It is in the fabric of our life. It is in each one of us. Um, ask anybody from AA, is it easy to not go back to the old ways? Ask anybody from Gamblers Anonymous, is it easy to live a life not controlled by addiction? They're going to tell you how hard it is. So we come to Jesus today, and of course we look for Jesus to say it's easy. Well, in a way, church is easy today, isn't it? All I got to do is fire up my computer, find Trinity's webpage, and I'm in church. But Jesus doesn't say if you want to be my church member, you got to be like this. You heard him say it today. If you want to be my disciple, there's a big difference between disciple and church member. See that word discipline there in disciple? You know, we hear some of what Jesus says so easily. Come unto me and, rest, and all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am easy, my, my burden is light. Well, yes, but the same Jesus also says a whole lot of other things that aren't so easy. You've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, that's just as bad. If you and your brother are having an argument, go to your brother before you even come to church and make amends. I tell you, um, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you just look, you're already, you have committed adultery. You've heard that it was said, love your friends and hate your enemies. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And you know what he's doing? He's taking us on a journey to a different place, a place where our behavior changes, a place where we can become like him. Um, this gospel lesson, do, do you see the good news in that gospel lesson? As hard as everything Jesus says in there, he's saying, you will be, you, it's enough to be like me. No, you're not me. You're not God. But working as hard as this is, working it all out, you're going to be a lot more like me. And, and the metaphor he uses, the, the sword that cuts through families. Well, again, ask anybody in AA if that doesn't happen. Ask anybody who's not trying to lead a better life if it doesn't feel like a sword is piercing their deepest relationships. What a, my, oh my, what a gospel lesson to hear on Father's Day, right? Uh, and yet there he is right, right in our face. Um, I think so much of what the Apostle Paul said in, the, in that epistle lesson that we heard today. Um, you know, you, <laughs> you must die. <laughs> Don't you know that when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ's death and you must be dead. And then with him, you can rise to new life. Uh, Paul knew what it was about. Paul knew that it is not easy. It's hard. Um, he, he spends the first couple chapters of Romans 
talking about us being oppressed by sin and us being caught by powers out of our control. He also spends so much time talking about the gift God gives us in Jesus Christ. The gift of salvation and how even though we couldn't do it, we couldn't make ourselves good, God has come and in Jesus Christ we have been made good. And, and then he asked the question, well, since Jesus did it all, since it's so easy, well, let's go on sinning. Because if grace abounds, sin can abound, and when sin abounds, there will be more grace. Don't even think that, he says. That's like the children of Israel looking back to the place of slavery. You don't want to go there. You have to move ahead. And you know what? It may be hard for you and it may be hard for me to always be listening to our Lord calling us to deeper levels of discipleship. And every time he does, we have to examine our hearts that much more deeply and see how much more we are out of kilter with him and let him fix us and let him work with us and let him call us to more grace and more beauty with him. Um, as hard as that is for us, it ain't easy. It's just that hard for God himself. God could have snapped his fingers in heaven and made it all better. But we know that's not what God did. God became one of us. No easy thing. And Paul says, you know, if we have died with him, and Jesus says, if they call the master Beelzebub, what, are they, what do you think they're going to do to you? Jesus was called the devil. And we all know what happened to Jesus for speaking to the powers. Yeah, they put him on a cross and he was in agony. And there he died to rise again for you and for me so that we would have his blessing and his power to live lives that are better than what we've known and lives that are always getting better. Um, until we get to that place. You know, when we, when we get to that place, we might be able to look back and say, that was easy. Well, we can't say it now. We're still on the journey. And can I go back to that metaphor? The children of Israel in the desert, so struggling so and so upset with Moses and with God for having such a hard time. And God decides to give them bread daily bread to hold them in their journey until they get to where they need to go, the land of milk and honey. I would give that to you. I would offer that to you, the Lord's Prayer, where we say, give us this day. I wish I could give you Holy Communion, but I can't. But I can give you the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, let us ask God to give us the bread we need, maybe not for the whole journey, because the journey's long, and the longer we think it is, the harder it gets. But bread for today, and let us take each day at a time, knowing that as we go forward, our Lord goes with us, knowing that God not only goes with us, but God is holding us and protecting us. And he who gave himself for us, he who died for us, will he not stay with us? Well, one more story, and I promise you it's the last. I, I, whenever I read the lessons for today, in all the lessons, one story kept coming back to my mind, and you may know the story. It was written by C.S. Lewis in the, in the story, in the book called The Great Divorce. Now, you might remember in The Great Divorce, uh, the, the narrator finds himself in a place he doesn't really know, but the place is hell. And he's, he's at a bus stop. He figures if I take the bus, maybe I'll get out of this place because it's not very nice here. And wouldn't you know it, there are other people at the bus stop, like five other people. And they're very mean people and they're very nasty people. And the bus comes and they all get on the bus. They have nasty things to say to the driver and to one another. Um, but this fellow gets on the bus with them and he discovers as they're on this bus, that where they were was this small, tiny, insignificant little crack 
in the, in the road. And the bus takes them to this most beautiful place, and it's heaven. Everything is big, and everything is beautiful. Everything is substantial. And when the people get out of the bus, all these sinners, all these people who had been condemned to hell, they discover that they're being given a chance to enter this wonderful place, uh, another chance. All the chances that they've turned down so far, they get another chance. They can choose heaven today. Well, most of them don't choose heaven. They choose to go back to this place because it's the only place they know and it's the only way they know how to live. They don't know how to live in love. They don't know love. There's one fellow in... Now, all these people, when they get into heaven, they, dis, they discover that it's very hard to see them because there's not much of them. They're just sort of like ghosts. They're unsubstantial. And uh, there's one fellow who is walking around with a lizard on his shoulder, and a very ghostly person with a very ghostly lizard. And the, the lizard is always speaking into this fellow's ear. And this fellow is a very sorry guy, and you can tell he's oppressed. You can tell he's, he's got a ton of addictions. You can tell this guy, this guy is longing for a better life. He's longing to be in heaven. And he keeps complaining about how hard it is and how hard it is to change. And then this beautiful, substantial person who turns out to be an angel, because the real characters in heaven are all real and substantial, solid. The angel comes to him and uh, says, let me kill it. Uh -uh. Kill what? That lizard on your shoulder, he's ruining you, and you know he's ruining you. It's, it's sin, folks. Oh, well, I don't know. I, uh, I'm sort of used to him. He, he likes it here, and I like having him. I, I like it this way, even though I don't like it this way. Let me kill it. Come on. I, I can kill it and free you, but I can only kill it with your permission. Well, how about if I, I'll go back to hell. I'll come back here some other day. I'll think about it. I might come back and you can do it. Then. No, no, no. Let me do it now. And this poor ghostly person says, okay. And the angel puts his hands on the lizard and kills it. The lizard disappears. The man disappears. But as you watch, you see a full-bodied person come to life. You see strong arms come to life. You see a youthful face come, a person of substance, form, and beauty. And then you see the lizard turn into this beautiful white stallion. And the man mounts his stallion and gallops off into the distance. What does it mean? It means we must die to our sin. It we, means we must die to all those ways we cling to the old and accept the new and take the new. And in other words, we must die. But you know what? It's only after we die that we rise again. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. We can't say it yet, but one day we'll look at him and we'll look at each other, and this is what we'll say. That was easy. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. Open our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another that differences might not overshadow our baptismal unity. We give you thanks for the fellowship of our congregation. Bless us in these times of separation caused by COVID and help us to find other ways of ministering to one another in this new and different time. Teach us how we might minister to each other through our speaking and listening. Show us new ways of servanthood so that we will make contact with the ill in mind and body, hoping to relieve a bit of their suffering. Lord, in your mercy. On this day, we pause to show our affection and appreciation for our fathers. Many of us can rejoice in our memories. 
of the sacrifices, the words of encouragement, the desire for one's children to have a better life. Comfort all who don't have those memories. Comfort all who long to be fathers, all for whom this day is difficult. We pray for fathers and mothers. If they've had children at home this spring, they found it necessary to step up, to help the children more with schoolwork, to teach and encourage the kids to practice social distancing, and to spend a large amount of time with the young ones. We pray that as the children are even more homebound in these next months, love will grow and children and parents will be a blessing to one another. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have created us in your own image. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice for all people in our communities and throughout our nation. O Christ, our Savior, you commanded us to love one another. We pray you would help all the people of our land. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We pray for an end to racism and discrimination. We pray for all who have been targets of injustice. Grant healing, grant restoration, grant love. O Christ, you came not to be ministered to, but to minister. Bless, we ask you, all who following in your steps, giving themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister in his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, giver of life and health, comfort and relieve your sick servants and give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs, that these for whom our prayers are offered may be strengthened in their weakness and have confidence in your loving care. Especially do we pray for these whose names we mention now. Lord, in your mercy. To that end, we pray for all the friends and relatives of Bobby Tinsley, uncle of Tammy DeVoe, Um, who entered eternal rest this last week. Comfort them with the promise of your comfort to him, Lord, in your mercy. Come to our aid as we deal with the COVID pandemic. Heal those who are sick. Support and protect the families and friends from being infected. Grant us your spirit of love and self-discipline so that we may come together working to to control and eliminate this disease. Until then, O Lord, inspire us all to be considerate of one another, traveling no more than is necessary, wearing our masks when in public, washing our hands often, remembering always that this disease is alive and with us now as much as it was three months ago when we first felt alarm. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you would have us, we pray in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord give you his favor and give you peace. Amen.